die for me and more, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of His saving for nothing, more of His love will die for me and more. to Woods Chapel United Methodist Church. You've noticed that we have a countdown now, so that can prepare you to know when you need to be in here. But when it hits zero, you land in your seat and something magnificent happens. So we're so glad to have you join us in worship. Uh, we worship a living God who is living and active among us, and we're so glad that you have come to be a part of that living God as we worship this morning. I want to invite you to stand, and let's uh, worship together by singing uh, our opening song, On Christ the Solid Rock I Stand. If you know this, sing with us now. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Just say that refrain with us. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Let us live like a people who have hope this morning. 
hear these great words that we do not need to be in despair for our hope is in the Lord sing this with us now I have a hope I have a hope I have a future I have a destiny that is yet awaiting me my life's not over a new beginning's just begun I have a hope I have this hope God has a plan It's not to harm me But it's to prosper me And to hear me when I call He intercedes for me Oh, working all things for my good Though trials may come I have this hope I will yet praise Him My great Redeemer I will yet stand up And give Him glory with my life He takes my darkness and he turns it into light I will yet praise him My Lord, my God Now we're going to say My God is for me He's not against me Lift your voice and sing it now My God is for me He's not against me So tell me who then Tell me who then shall I fear He has prepared for me Great works to help me to complete I have a home I have this hope, goodness and mercy, they're gonna follow me, and I'll forever dwell in the house of my great king, no eye has ever seen, all he's preparing there for me, I have this hope, I have this hope, say it now, I will yet praise him, my great redeemer, I will yet stand up. And give Him glory with my life He takes my darkness Oh, and He turns it into light I will yet praise Him My Lord, my God Hear these words now There's still hope for me today Cause the God of heaven loves me Say it with us now there's still hope for me today Cause the God of heaven loves Come on church now, there's still hope There's still hope for me today Cause the God of heaven loves me One more time we say there's still hope There's still hope for me today Cause the God of Yet praise Him, my great Redeemer. I will yet stand up and give Him glory with my life. He takes my darkness, oh, and He turns it into light. I will yet praise Him, my Lord, my God. I will yet praise Him, my great Redeemer. I will yet stand up and give Him glory with my life. Takes my darkness, oh, and he turns it into light. I will yet praise him, my Lord, my God. I will yet, yet praise him. No matter what, I will praise him. There's still hope for me today, because the God of heaven loves me all right would you turn to someone next to you close by to you give them a high five and say there's still hope there's still hope i love the sound of the high five for the god of heaven oh he loves me yes he loves me you may be seated this morning I want to take just a minute this morning to uh, tell you about a couple of things that are going on in the life of our congregation. Very good morning. Good morning. Uh, they're very exciting things, actually. Um, very, very interesting. There's a new bulletin format that is coming our way in the next few weeks or months. So we'll have the opportunity for individuals or businesses to sponsor those weekly bulletins. 
Um, it will provide, give us the opportunity to do uh, some really cool things with the Sunday morning worship publications. And also over the year, uh, they estimate it's going to save the church about $25,000. So if you're interested in sponsoring a bulletin, uh, call the church office. On your stub today is an opportunity for you to sign up for Financial Peace University. Excellent program, helps people kind of live their lives in, in perspective. Take a look at that. Tonight at 5 o'clock, we've been announcing this for a few weeks as our all-church conference. Um, this is a, a meeting that we're having about a potential addition to our building. There are packets available in the foyer at the information desk and the connecting table that you can pick up and has the plans and a lot of questions and answers in there. After the all-church conference, um, we are going to have just kind of a general discussion, kind of a congregational discussion uh, about the possibility of a cell tower being sited on our property. I tell you, there's lots of exciting things going on right now. And then I just want you to know, today's our last day for our uh, back-to-school drive for needy children, and we're kind of behind. Um, there are a number of children yet to be um, sponsored for back-to-school, so please consider stopping at the missions table and uh, helping a child after church today. Let's be in an attitude of prayer. Father, you, you didn't say much when you, when you called your disciples. You said, follow me. So this morning as we come into worship, we are here to say that we will follow. So we cast our, our, our cares, we cast our sins, we cast all that we are upon you so that you would take us and teach us what's that, what that means to follow you. Work it out in our lives, we pray, as we lift this prayer together, our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hear the words of this song um, this morning, and we're going to invite you to sing, us, sing it with us. Um, this is our prayer this, this, this morning.
soul is I give all my soul to you. As you know, uh, yesterday we had our, our great day of missions. We had over 150 people come out and uh, take part in that and taking the church out and, and doing great works in the, in the community. And one of the comments that was made to me as we did that um, was by uh, Missy Nance, our connecting minister, who went over to the, um, uh, the, the Hispanic church that we, um, our, sister, our sister church uh, up north. And she said, we... In two hours, we had 33 people up there, and you, it was amazing what we did in two hours, painting doors and painting bathrooms. Um, think about what we could do to transform our city. And this, uh, this song was written with that same sort of notion as, what, what, what is it that we can do as the body of Christ to transform our world um, for His glory? Because there is no one like our God. There is no one like our God. And just hear these words. And greater things have yet to come. And greater things are still to be done in this city. Yeah. And greater things have yet to come. Greater things are still to be done in the city. Would you just say those words with me now? Greater things have yet to come. Greater things are still to be done in the city. Let's make that be our prayer this morning. You're the God of this city. You're the King of these people. You're the Lord of this nation. You are. You're the light in the darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. There's no one like our God. There is no one like our God. There is no one like God. Lift your voice and say, greater things have yet to come. Greater things have yet to come. Greater things are still to be done in this city.
we're going to show you a quick video um, as we um, count down here. We're going to show you a video of a little bit of your choices uh, for yesterday. You'll see it's a kind of a humorous look at kind of our work yesterday that we did on the mission field out in um, Kansas City. So here it comes. Are you guys still serving breakfast? No. Oh. Well, um, can I get a kid's meal with chicken tenders? Okay, who blew the lunch whistle? I heard it. Hi. Um, This morning we've been having a conversation that has, has uh, inevitably, be, inevitably veered off into the form of relationships and missions. And, and that's just a little glimpse of how exciting it is to be able to serve some of the people. And then I look out at, at just in this section of the room, there's like five guys that I've been in the mission field with in the last two months. And it puts this whole exciting thing about being the church. And we want to touch on that this morning. But in the form of a conversation, uh, if you're around this building on any given day, uh, these kind of conversations seem to be taking place a lot. 
we're asking how we can better be the church in mission, and, and, and we're beginning to, uh, to move forward in a conversation about that. Chris mentioned we had 150 people yesterday, and it truly was a great day of mission, but yesterday's over. So the conversation today is, what can we continue to do to be the church? And so I've got Julia Fleener, Billy McLean, and, and uh, Chris Bartman here. And I want to touch on that about relationships. Chris, you've mentioned, uh, I talked about the aspect of relationships as the people that you serve with in the mission field. And, and you can talk a little bit about that, but you've also got this whole other thing about relationships that I think we need to explore this morning. Yeah, one, one of the pictures, um, I was at Hillcrest with Billy yesterday, and one of the pictures that I came away from that um, that experience with was um, doing mission work is more than um, our, peop- our people are the ones who have and they have not. Our, we have what's found and they have what's lost. And doing mission work is about building these relationships. So just a little picture of that. When we were serving at Hillcrest yesterday, we brought food and we ha- brought backpacks um, for these kids who were residents in this transitional housing unit. And um, we we were able to kind of break through the fact that here's all our stuff, we're going to lay it at you, and we'll see you later. Um, we thought it was really important that we would sit and we would learn their names, that we would know what their interests are, that they would, we would hear their struggles. And, and by going around and talking about some of that, we were able to break through that. And that's one of the most important things about um, mission work is kind of getting to know the people that you're with. Okay. And Julia, you... Uh Yesterday, while we were doing this great day of mission, you're on your way back from South Dakota. You've been home for about 12 hours. You're, you're doing student mission work in South Dakota. Three weeks ago, you were with us in Guatemala. I'd like for you to touch on your experiences um, based on what Chris said. Relationships that you formed not only in the church, not only with people that you went with, but, but relationships with the people that you met and served alongside of in South Dakota and, and also in Guatemala. Well, um, I think anyone who's been on a trip can say that when you're on a trip with other people, the people you go with, those relationships grow and you become a lot closer. Um, even some of the kids I went on South Dakota trip were all sitting in the front together, and you just kind of form this bond with each other, and that's a beautiful thing. It happens on a mission trip, but it also is really important to remember that you are going to serve other people and that the relationship you build with them is going to be the thing that they remember. Um, in South Dakota, it was, it was a little different. I've never really experienced this before, but we were reinventing the image that group of people had of Christians. We were on an Indian reservation, and they had been hurt by the church. And so that relationship that we were trying to have with them, the the love we were giving them, was the most important thing we were doing on that trip. And whenever you go on a mission trip, people want to know that that you love them. They want to know that you're loved, and that is why you're there. That's the number one reason, is to love on them, to show them God's love through that. And uh, it's a really rewarding thing to do. It's probably the most rewarding part of a mission trip. And, and Billy, you, on the flip side, are doing, our church as a whole is doing a lot of stuff locally. We talked about the back to school, the backpack program, Hillcrest, Ronald McDonald House. These are all, all mission, uh, local mission opportunities that you're leading or that you're serving along. And, and talk about those, but also talk about, especially the, the, what Chris is mentioning, about the relationships that you're forming here locally. Well, I'll kind of revert back to Hillcrest yesterday. Um, you saw a lot of pictures of those kids. Um, and we know those kids now. And, it, you know, the thing that was so great for me to see was the 20 people from Woods Chapel that, that came out and, and gave of their time and of themselves yesterday to see them interacting with those residents and with those kids. Uh, we packed 120 sack lunches for the homeless in Westport with those kids. And it was such a great experience. They were so eager to help. Um, and, and it just... The whole day was great to see the joy that they got when the 31 school-aged kids got backpacks and they would wear them around and they wouldn't take them off. And, um, you know, they were, it it just was a great experience to see our people interacting with them and um, building those relationships. So it was, it was a really great day to see that, to see that happen. Okay. And and the last thing I want to do, I want want to ask you guys basically the same question. But, but in three different ways, because you're talking about three different segments of the community. Julia, um, inevitably, I, I, I meet a lot of people who, who are worried about, about their kids that, that are your age or, or they're, they're closer to my age, and they're saying, why, why is someone like Julia going to the mission field? Why are you guys doing Why are you serving? And, and, and what I want to know is, is how, what do you say to your friends who, who ask, why, why do you do this? And, and if someone's listening and maybe they're on the fringe, they're, they're, they're not 
serving right now, but they're thinking about it, what do you say to them? Wow. Um, I don't know. I really can't think of anything better to do with my time. Um, I just... Why? Because I I've, I've mean, the first mission trip I ever went on, I think, for a week or so was um, in middle school. And so it was with other kids my age, but it's just a completely different atmosphere and a different type of community when you go on a trip like that. And once you you experience the, the closeness you get with the people on your on your team and like the joy that God just puts in your heart when you're helping those people and you see the smile on their faces and you know that you really are doing something in someone else's life, okay. that is just, I don't know, I can't, there's no way I could ever not want to do that. And Billy and Chris, in about, in about a minute between you, I want you to talk about this, this thing that blocks us off from serving a mission. That's, I don't have enough time, or I, I have enough time for my family. You guys are both, about, you both have, have, have families that you have to serve, and you both have jobs. How do you find time? What do you say to those people? Just a few seconds. Well, you know, we, we all have a limited amount of time, and it's really just about prioritizing. And one thing that, the one thing that we can all do as a first step is to do, do something missional as a family. Um, there's so many opportunities to serve others as a family. There's such a great need in our community here. Um, you don't have to go to Africa. You don't have to go um, travel if that if that doesn't fit in with what you you know with what you can do right now. Um, there's so great of a need here that we we all can we all can do that now. Chris, what's the last word? Yeah, I have five kids, and I'm realizing as the kids get older, the presents that we buy for them get more expensive. I don't know if any of you have experienced that. <laughs> um, it's never enough. Uh, the, the, the things that we give our kids is, are never enough. But what if we taught our kids what it is to give? And I'm not saying that it's one or the other, but if we can teach our kids to have a heart of giving, Man, what, what would that do to transform our family and transform the way that we looked at the world and the way that we thought? Okay. I want to thank you guys. I also want to thank you guys for, for the participating in the Great Day of Mission and uh, invite you to rest up today because tomorrow is another opportunity for a Great Day of Mission. Thank you. Let's stand for our scripture reading. James chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their need and distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Dear friends, this is the word of the Lord. May God send his Holy Spirit to bless it to our hearts as we gather in his name today. Please be seated. I'd like to, uh, like to be clear with you today that my intent is to open your brain, stir it up, and challenge your life paradigm and to invite you to think about some of this a little differently. What is the religion that Jesus accepts? What is the Christian faith that is acceptable to God? Is it simply coming to sit in the pew, going to church, sitting around feeling saved, singing joyful songs because I feel saved? Studying the Bible, sharing your faith, learning about doctrine so you can defend the faith, behaving in an ethical Christian manner. All that is good stuff. But until we understand that the Christian faith invites us to reach out to the poor and needy, all the rest of that stuff is shallow. And I want to tell you why. Because every one of those things that I mentioned, while being a good thing, those are things that are primarily for us. We can blithely go along with our lives feeling like a good Christian because we studied the Bible or went to church. 
But when we understand that the Christian faith invites us to reach out to the needy, we have to leave our comfort zone. We have to leave the life where we are at the center of the world and start to live the Christian life that is out there, focused on others, understanding that those people are God's children as well. And what about that part of the verse that says, keeping yourself from being polluted by the world? You know, when I was young, I was part of a church, and they taught us that means you got to be holy. you got to be really good. Girls, you have to dress like this, and you can't dress like this, and you wear your hair like this, and you wear your hair like that. And you always do the certain things that look sort of holy, and heaven forbid you ever go into a bar because you have to look holy. Is that what it's about? Looking? I wonder, when I think about this scripture today, to keep ourselves from being polluted by the world, isn't God inviting us to reject the paradigm of this culture that says, it's yours, take it, whatever you want, consume it, enjoy it. It's the dream, it's yours. I want to suggest to you today that the teachings of Jesus that we go out and care about the needy stand in stark contrast to what our culture tells us. And if we would be successful in fulfilling his mission, we have to set aside all those things that pull upon us and understand that God cares about those that are out there. Um, Last week, I was driving to one of my favorite stores, speaking of consumerism, Nebraska Furniture Mart. And I get in the truck, and I start driving, and I'm not very far, and I realize the truck's about out of gas. That's what happens when you have kids in college. Every car you get into doesn't have any gas in it, right? Uh, that's not fair. <laughs> but uh, so, so I'm, I'm in my mind, I'm, I'm laying out the path from where I'm at to that place, and where can I get gas? And I remember the last time I got gas downtown that I had a very uncomfortable um, encounter with someone who very brazenly walked up to me and wanted money. Um, and that's, that was unusual for me. I mean, I'm, I'm used to it when you come to the stoplight somewhere, but they approached me, as, and, and so I, I wanted to avoid that. Just wanted my afternoon to be comfortable. So I pulled into the BP station across from Royal Stadium, and I'm filling up with gas, and somebody's car's blaring loud music next to me, and I hear this voice on the other side of the pickup, which is about five feet. Hey, can you help me? I need some money. And I don't even hear all of it, really, because this music is really loud, and, and we're so human. I mean, I... I'm tensing up, and, and, and what's going on in my brain? Okay, I want to help you, but I'm pumping gas right now. I'm not getting into, I am not getting my wallet out while I'm standing here pumping gas. And he keeps saying, can you help me? I need help. And so finally I get done pumping the gas, and I hang it up, and I go around the truck back to the other side, and I have a $5 bill. Here you go. Turn around. Realize he's following me. Now, does that make you feel funny? And I stopped and turned around, and he's about four feet from me. He looks me right in the eyes. And he says, thank you very much. Someday, somehow, some way, I will pay you back. And I went on my way, and I thought, we forget that these are people. And one of the great blessings of that moment was I saw into his soul, the eyes of the window of the soul, I saw that this is a good person that God loves. And you know what? I don't care what he does with that $5. I was glad to help. Yesterday I was with a group that went to the Habitat house had the opportunity to visit with the homeowner who was there working with the 30 people from Woods Chapel, hearing her story about living with two small children in a part of town 
that is so dangerous that they can't go outside to play. But now, because of the work of all of you and others on that Habitat house, she's going to own a home, and her kids are going to be able to go outside and play. And I see the, the joy and happiness that this person has as she is participating in building her future. These are not just statistics. This is not just a house. This is not a sheetrock job. These are God's people. And so I'm leaving the Habitat house, and I drive up Sterling, and I turn left on 40, and I get underneath the bridge there where you're going to turn on I-70, and there's always somebody there that wants something, right? And um, uh, I notice the cars in front of me. There's an old beat-up pickup followed by a Jesus pickup. And what I mean by that, this is a brand new, spotless, beautiful black Toyota pickup. It has five bumper stickers for Jesus on the back. And we roll up there, okay, and if I got money, I'm going to help. So I'm just watching what's happening. And the old beat-up kind of Arkansas pickup, no offense if you're from, you could see all the way through that thing. <laughs> that's, that's the first handout out the window with money. Your preacher was second. I was a little slow. The guy in the Jesus pickup doesn't even turn his head. Now, I'm not judging him, okay? I'm, I'm not doing that. I don't have the right to do that. Maybe he didn't have any money. But what I thought in that moment was, is that how I live my life sometimes? Is that how we live our lives sometimes where we've plastered all around the outside of us the trappings of faith, the ornaments of, of, of Christianity, when it comes time to help the widows and the orphans and those who are truly in need, we pass by. And right there under that bridge, I thought of a scripture that haunts me that no one wants to put on their refrigerator. It's from 1 John chapter 3. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how does the love of God dwell in him? Today we come to the table of the Lord. And there are a lot of things that we think about when we come to the Lord's table. We remember the suffering of Jesus. We remember his sacrifice. We say thank you. We ask for forgiveness of sins. Sometimes we pray that this bread will sustain us for the journey. One of my favorite pictures of the Lord's Supper comes from the Latin, and it's where the word mass came from that the Catholics use when they speak of their, their time of, of the Lord's Supper. And the Latin is ist missing n it means you are sent and so this meal is a reminder that we receive it and we're sent out into the world and i wondered if it was fair is it fair that we just pick and choose what picture of communion we want to have maybe maybe they all go together Maybe they all follow one right after the next. Maybe in a logical pro progression, when we come to the table, every time we should think, I remember what you did. I thank you for what you did. Please forgive my sin. Let this bread fill and sustain me for the journey because I know I am sent. Chris Bartman has a new t-shirt he's very proud of. On the back, it says, the church has left the building. And I invite you to understand that whatever we're doing is not the Christian faith until we understand that we are sent to the least of these. Let's pray. And so, Father, let your Holy Spirit rest upon these elements, the bread and the cup. By them this day, give us your strength.
that we might remember and say thank you. Wash away our sins. Let us have a new beginning this day. And fill us with your strength that as we leave this place, we understand that we are in the mission field. So bless us and call us and remind us of our purpose in this world as we come to your table. In Jesus' name, amen.